Robert Dean and I am the minister of the Trumansburg United Methodist Church. We are gathered here for our midweek study, which is an opportunity for us to learn more about the scriptures, to go deeper into things we can't necessarily do on Sunday morning, and sometimes to try out new things. This week we're trying out a new thing. I have a new camera and if I can get it to edit properly, uh, it'll hopefully help us to spend some time going into some different issues that we haven't dealt with before. Now, one of the things I'm sometimes asked by people um, is, how do I keep figuring out what to say Sunday mornings? How do you keep from being a broken record? Now, there's two aspects to that. One of which is, at some level, you do choose to be a broken record on certain subjects. Subjects that are in integral to your belief, to your faith, to what you want to share as a minister. If you have a legacy you leave behind, uh, you have a choice. You can leave behind sporadic little bits of this, that, and the other thing, or you can push towards a few goals. Uh, another way of looking at that is, as a minister, I'm asked effectively, what do I want to leave behind when I leave? If I'm only at a church for a year or 10 years, what would I hope people would take away from that time? Uh, and for me, one of the things that I like to do is be a broken record about how much God loves them, about how there's forgiveness and redemption in this world, about how there can even be joy in the midst of sorrow. Um, and so I tend to repeat those things. But along with that, I can't give the same sermon every week. And so the question becomes, where do I find the material? And for me, the answer is pretty obvious. I go to our scriptures and I study them. Now, one of the things that's really important to know about studying scripture is that there's no one right way to do it. Uh, I had a wonderful Sunday school student the other, the other week, last month, I believe, uh, say something to the effect of, you're not going to let me tell, you're not going to say I'm wrong, are you? And I'm like, no, I, I don't think you ever are wrong. I think that you... Uh, have your own opinions, and that's a wonderful thing. So one of the ways that I go about study is to look at the text and look at it carefully. Uh, and so what I have here is I have this wonderful board, which will hopefully help us to go deeper into our study together. And one of the things I want to do, because this is releasing on the 6th of October, is to look at Psalm 6 today and look through one way that I analyze scripture and then hopefully take a lesson away from it. And so for Psalm 6, um, one of the things I do often is look at who are the major people in this particular section of the scriptures. What is the story about? Who are the people? And so on one hand, uh, we have persons who are represented by the psalmist. Now, historically, um, the psalmist is considered King David. Um, and so the psalmist speaks on behalf of the people who are a part of that world, who are part of that perspective. And so, yes, it speaks for the psalmist, but it also speaks for us as we read them. Especially if we engage in a psalm in a personal way, if we look at the psalm and say, what does this have to do with my life? Uh, the psalmist can, in fact, speak on behalf of us. And so as we engage with the psalm, it is one of those places where it's very important to look at uh, what the person says, what the psalmist says. And the other major actor in this particular section is God. Um, there are also um, some discussion at time about enemies, but that comes later in the psalm. So one of the things I do is I often write down descriptive words that come about as we look at the story of this person whom we are studying. Now, here we have an aspects of God starting. Uh, we're going to read the psalm together, uh, hopefully. Now, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, but hopefully uh, this will uh, translate across whatever, re reason, whatever translation you use. This is Psalm 64, 6, Psalm 6. O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. 
Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are shaking with terror. My soul is also struck with terror. Why have you, O Lord? How long? Turn, O Lord, save my life. Deliver me for the sake of your steadfast love, for in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who can give you praise? I am weary with with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping. My eyes waste away because of grief. They grow weak because of all my foes. Depart from me, all you workers of evil, for the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. The Lord has heard my supplication. The Lord accepts my prayer. All my enemies shall be ashamed and struck with terror. They shall turn back and in a moment be put to shame. So again, we have the person who is writing this, the persons in our perspective is people who are reading along. Uh, There is God and there are enemies. The enemies come in the last few verses. But from the very beginning, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. So when we look at God, we see it's someone who might be angry. And that is a theme that happens often in the scriptures. We also uh, might see someone who disciplines. um, And even has wrath. Wrathful. Now, those are strong words. Uh, But there's another side to this, because in addition to this anger, this disciplinary nature, uh, this wrathful nature, there's also a sense at which um, God is seen as gracious. Uh, God is also seen um, at some level as being mighty. Now, we will come back to that, but I get that out of the fact that our person is dealing with very specific issues and is turning to God for help. Uh, One does not turn to someone who cannot help for help. Um, So what is our person going through? Our psalmist, our self, as we connect with it, uh, we have words of languishing. Uh, We have words of shaking. We have words like terror. And that comes back later. So we're going to underline that. So in the midst of all this, this anger, this disciplinary, this wrathful, this gracious and mighty God, there is a a difference between the two parties. So we have one side, we have God who can be angry and wrathful and also discipline. God who is strong, but is also seen as gracious and mighty. And the other side, we have the person, the psalmist ourselves, and we connect with it, who is things like languishing, they are shaking, they are filled with terror. Later, there's a strong connection to tears. Uh, Tears and um, wasting away. Um, There is some level at which we see the psalmist writing this as dealing with trouble. The psalmist is moaning. The psalmist is struggling. The psalmist is flooding a bed with tears and drenching a couch with weeping. Um, And that's strange because what we have here is someone who has no power, who is weak, who is sad, who is grief-filled, who is terrorized. And we have this God who is strong. And we see the one reaching out to the other. Um, And that may not be weird, but it's sometimes easy to forget that people who are going through situations uh, often turn to those they need help from. Um, In our culture, it's it's often very difficult to understand what it means to have very little. Uh, A lot of us, especially those of us who would be on YouTube watching a video, uh, have more than enough to survive on. We have food, we have maybe computers or phone or some form of technology to watch this video. Um, the idea of being in a place where fiscally we languish, we shake with terror, uh, that we waste away can be a bit hard for us. 
Uh, especially since our enemies these days usually aren't violent in nature, at least on a day-to-day -day basis, at least in this particular perspective. Um, we have people who are proud. When we ask God to bring shame to our enemies, it's because there's no shame in them at that point. Um, they're unafraid. We ask for them to be struck by terror, which again, we come back to the idea of terror again. Um, we have people who need to turn back because they are, they are right there. They are approaching. And that's the difficult thing here, is that there are two primary parties in this psalm. Uh, there's the person writing the psalmist, and there is God. And then there's this other party that's coming, these enemies that are proud, they're unafraid, they're right in front. Uh, when the NRSV connected this to a situation, they called it a prayer for recovery from grave illness. And you can kind of see how that comes across. Uh, there's languishing, there are tears, there's wasting away, there's words that really connect with the medical side of things. Uh, this person is truly suffering. Uh, but when it comes to the end, what we find is someone who is calling out to God for help, who is connecting to these aspects of God in their own personal relationship um, and asking for help, for they are afraid their enemies are coming. Uh, they are right there. They need to depart from the psalmist because they're right in front of them. They're working evil. They're doing difficult, painful things. And so we have here a psalmist who has a purpose. The purpose is what? Well, I think first, um, the psalmist needs help. Why would a psalmist need help? What is the possible need they have? And the reality is we see a psalmist, the person facing situation where they have enemies who are right in front of them, who are unafraid. They find themselves waking up in tears, falling asleep in tears, wasting away, languishing, sorrowful. And they need help. And so they're calling out for help. And two, and we'll come back to this, um, it's a continuation of faith. That they are calling out to God for help. And this is not the first time that they've needed help. This isn't maybe the first time they've even sung this song, if they're a psalmist. Perhaps they've sung this song day after day after day. And that can be very challenging. So when you look at all this and you say, okay, you've looked at the fact that there is a God who is strong, a psalmist who is suffering. Uh, you've taken a look at the fact that there are enemies and struggles. What do you do with that now that you've laid those out? Well, I think we look at the very purpose of the psalm, of what it can teach us. There are some lessons here. Lessons from Psalm 6. P.S. is the abbreviation of Psalm, by the way. And the first is this. The persons in our church history have struggled. Now, it can be difficult to understand how I get that from this. Uh, but the reality is we have this, per this psalm that is supposedly written by King David. And King David is a major figure in Judeo-history and theology. It's the, the king of... Uh, ancient Israel, who was a person who is a very forefather of Christ. It is someone who has um, taken the reins of a country, who has come out of nothing as a shepherd to be king over all of the land. A person who is faithful and who wishes to uh, create a temple to the living God. Someone who has gone forth in might. Uh, but even this person who is powerful and strong and mighty and famous and rich, they struggle. And so what do we learn from this? Well, if David, who is the king of Israel, who has all of his power, all of his might, all of his worth, if David struggles, then it makes sense that at times most people will struggle. 
Now, this is a difficult one to grasp onto, and I rarely, if ever, in fact, I would say I never say this anywhere near a funeral, anywhere near something where someone is possibly in grief. Uh, the reality is we often ask the question, why am I struggling? What have I done wrong? Where did I, who did I offend? What level at which is this all my fault? And the reality is that sometimes even people as powerful and strong as King David, people as righteous, as good as King David, they struggle too. Struggle is part of the human condition. And sometimes the question is not, why is this happening to me such a, so much as, why not me? With all the things in the world, with all the challenges, with all the struggles, do we really expect to coast through life without facing a single challenge, a thing, single difficulty, a single sorrow? That's highly unlikely. Psalm 6 points out that people struggle. Even King David struggles. And that leads into the second part. Um, persons who go through the situation, um, they may need faith. And where I get this from is when I said before, uh, this may not be the first time that they've dealt with this situation. When King David, the psalmist, writes about moaning every night, flooding his bed with tears, uh, drenching a couch with weeping. This isn't something that happens just once. This is something that's happened to David over and over again. He has done it so often that it has become something stuck in his mind. And that's a difficult thing to realize that sometimes in life, um, we not only face struggles, but we face them in such a consistent way that we get into a pattern of grief, a pattern of sorrow. Uh, but through the midst of this, the psalmist does not quit. The psalmist has been in grief. The psalmist has cried out. The psalmist is calling out. And at no point in the psalm does he give up and say that this is the end, that I will never struggle again, that I am done. He has faith that even though his bed is soaked, even though his couch is soaked, even though it's been soaked before, he will continue to have faith. And there's something in that for us to walk away from. That people need faith. And sometimes the time they need faith most isn't when the faith seems to have come uh, to result in some great, powerful, wonderful works that are not the slightest bit questionable. Often the time we need faith the most is when we can feel it the least. Uh, when it seems the least substantial thing we have, sometimes it's the very thing we need. Um, when King David here in the psalm, as traditionally attributed, says that the enemies will turn back and in a moment be put to shame, uh, his enemies are right upon him. If this truly is an illness, it is right there in his midst. He is in the middle of the struggle. And yet, despite the fact this happened time after time, despite the fact that he's cried out, time after time, despite the fact that he has flooded a bed with tears time and time. This is a moment where he has faith. It says, even though it hasn't happened yet, it will happen. And that's a powerful lesson to walk away with from this. And third, I think the reality is um, a question of perspective. We looked at this and we saw that there were three main characters here. There's the psalmist, who writes the psalm. There is God. There are enemies. I think one of the realities is, in the midst of all of this, uh, we may not be able to deal with the enemies, we may not be able to answer for God, but the reality is, if we know that people go through these situations, if we go through them ourselves, uh, sometimes the best thing that can come out of the situation when we are the psalmist is to return later and walk alongside others who are going through similar struggles. To walk alongside them, to care for them, to love them, because the reality is, look at what the psalmist is going through. The psalmist has eyes for nothing around him but the sorrow. Uh, he sees his enemies. 
he sees God, he calls out to God, and he sees his own sorrow. But at no point does his perspective ever shift to see the community around him who cares for them. And maybe in the psalmist situation, there isn't one. But in our situation, we often can find people in our church going through situations like the psalmist in Psalm 6. And one of the most powerful things we can do is remember how much it was helpful in those moments and walk alongside someone else, to care for them, to be there for them in their hour of need. And that can be a powerful, powerful gift. So, you know, as the weeks go on, I hope that we'll have more opportunity to go deeper into looking at how we look at Scripture. That's just a quick glance at how you analyze a passage. Now, out of that, I might draw a number of things. But the most important thing is that I hopefully would learn something for myself in the midst of everything. One of the reasons we do Bible study as Christians is not because we need to memorize, but because the scriptures we read tend to teach us the very things we need to know in this life. And so if there is a subject, a scripture, if there's some particular thing you want to look at, please let me know. And we can take a look at one of these weeks. We can use this tool to say, how do we analyze another passage or another situation, or even look at a complex issue. But in the meantime, I do hope this was helpful. I pray that you do know the love of God in your life and that it is powerful, fresh, and near to you in these moments. I pray that God will watch over you. And until we meet together again, either in person on Sunday or next week's study, I pray that you feel blessed and know the love of God in your life. Go in peace, and may the God of peace be with you both now and always. Amen.